Okay, so on Friday, we ended up with some very bipedal creatures, the australopiths, the ones that have definitive evidence, skeletal, both skeletal evidence and those volcanic ash prints for being very bipedal. We're not completely sure how creatures became bipedal, but boy, they sure are bipedal by about two and a half to three million years ago. We have habitual bipedalism going on there with the uh, Australopithecines in Africa. Um, so as we ended the last class, the idea of being mobile is enormously important. It's at the heart of human evolution. It's one of the key aspects that makes us into the human beings we are, is being able to be bipedal and walk around like that. So in this class, we get up to some, some different creatures that are mostly part of the mostly part of the genus that we label Homo, starting with, well, we're going to start with Homo erectus. Fortunately, one of you liked Homo erectus. Ariana, what do you have to tell us about Homo erectus? Mo yeah. Yeah, so in terms of the body stuff, we have a couple things going on. We have, uh, as, as we talked about with the osteopaths, we still have ape-like cranial structure or ape-like brain capacity, um, but bipedal. But by the time you get to Homo erectus, you definitely have some cranium expansion going on. So around 2 million years ago, the, the heads, the brains are getting bigger, and we're getting some taller specimens as well, averaging around five feet, and some of them even over six feet tall. So, you know, getting pretty big there. Yeah, and what are they doing, Ariana? What are they up to? What behaviors do we see? to use fire, yeah. So we have, we'll talk about this more in the next unit, talk about archeology, span but there's a more, so we see the evidence of stone tools coming in about three million years ago, maybe, or two and a half million years ago, but they're pretty rudimentary. Whereas with Homo erectus, we have some, a more sophisticated tool making tradition developing, including the, the very famous hand axes, and evidence for hunting. Um, some people have speculated that the first form of hunting or one of the primary forms of hunting was using that bipedalism to not only be able to endurance walk over terrain, but to endurance run. Humans are the only primate who can do things like run a marathon and keep running because of our ability to sweat and to control our body temperature in that way, you can actually, if you are a fit human, you can take one of those deer that you see in the morning and just start running after it. And eventually the deer will be faster than you at first, but if you can keep going, you can run that deer down and you can get it. You don't even need to have that much weaponry on you. You can just get it. So. That will be your assignment for Tuesday. <laughs> when you get up in the morning and see one of those Hartwig deer around, just see if you can do it. I've often threatened to turn this into a phys ed class on endurance hunting. Actually, one of when I grew up in Montana, where it was one person, you have to be pretty fit, and it helped that it was once the snow fell, you could get on the deer tracks and actually 
run a deer down. So people got really excited about this. You may see on the web sometimes people are like, ha, ah, endurance running, that's what all humans should be doing all the time. We're all selling sneakers and stuff. Um, there are There is some contradictory evidence to this as well. So I, I don't want to, some people get really into this, but you know, there, there may be other forms of as we'll talk about hunting than simply endurance hunting, but it is an interesting fact about uh, the, uh, the homo species. Zarian tells us they, uh, they seem to, uh, some people get really excited also about the cooking part. Some people are like, oh no, they maybe had, were able to kind of use fire, but they didn't have control over fire. So I put a little a bit of a question mark there. There is you know, pretty good evidence that they start using fire. And extremely important for us is that uh, this is the first time that we have a bipedal expansion from Africa. So you have an expansion of the range of bipedal creatures out of Africa for the first time. Again, almost all the good stuff in human evolution happens in Africa, but at this time, Homo erectus is actually found in different places from about 1.9 to 2 million years ago. So we again see, we see the emergence of Homo erectus in Africa. Oops, where's my pointer? Um, we see the emergence of Homo erectus in Africa, but we see some of the first specimens were actually found in what is now China and down here and what is now Indonesia and in Eurasia as well. And so you have this expansion out of the range um, of the bipedal creatures and especially with Homo erectus. And there's been a pretty huge question is, you know, what happens to the lineages uh, you know, how does Homo erectus interact with these various lineages? How does Homo erectus get to be Homo sapiens? This has been a, a huge question and up for a lot of debate. And in the last 20 years, there have been a lot of finds and a lot of speculation. And so that's why I asked you to kind of look into your favorite, your favorite species that is represented in in science or pop culture and compare it to what our text finds. So we have Homo erectus spreading out and then we have some confusing stuff that happens. But for our purposes, we'll first say that again, remember being able to migrate and being able to adapt and learn and change in response to a changing environment are crucial to the spread of the bipedal creatures Homo erectus into different areas. So there they go. Now, I gave you a bunch of names that you could look up, but Cass decided that you wanted to take on Homo heidelbergensis. Why? <laughs> kind of a funny name. Yeah, how did it get Homo heidelbergensis? Ah, uh, yes, the city of Heidelberg, they were digging something up. I think a worker actually found, found this and you get a whole species named after the jaw of something that happened in Heidelberg. But you found that this is a super important species and should be way more discussed in our textbook, you say. sounds pretty bad. Yeah, our book is, is obviously messing it up. I guess what I would say here, and I, I kind of agree with you, I guess there are some really important things that are happening around 700,000 years ago. The reason I was not into Honomo Heidelbergensis, and I don't think your book is either, is that there's a, a lot of confusion over 
when exactly this, don't write this down. This is all from Wikipedia, you can get this. Where, when, and why? Because here's a jaw found in Heidelberg, you know, and it's sort of an, again, an overrepresentation of the European content. And then they're like, aha, the Homo Heidelberg did all these great things, like is living in here. Then somebody finds a skull in Africa and calls it, oh, what was it called? Homo Rodensius, which has to do with Rhodesia and the colony was, was named after a colony. And so some people are like, aha, that's Homo Heidelberg over there too. Look, they're everywhere. But some people want to can expand out the Homo Heidelberg thing. Some people want to just lump Heidelberg together with Homo erectus. And so as Wikipedia says, and I think this is still true, that this middle period, there's, there's a lot going on, but there's a lot of muddle as well. And so whether you're gonna call this Heidelberg and go and use that to indicate a whole range of creatures from Africa to Asia to Europe, or whether you're gonna call each of them different species, or whether you're going to, like me, want to just say, ah, it's basically Homo erectus. <laughs> so you have to realize that when I say something, I am an extreme lumper. Remember we talked about the lumpers and the splitters? The splitters hold up a jaw and they're like, a new species, I found it. And I am on the opposite extreme where I feel like, yes, there was a lot of variation here, but I'm not gonna tell you about that much about Homo habilis, which some people wanna put before Homo erectus. And then I'm not gonna tell you that much about Homo heidelbergensis, which some people say comes after Homo erectus, because for me, they're all kind of in the range of Homo erectus. And Cass, I totally agree that they're doing cool new things, but I don't know that they're that different from what Homo erectus is doing. I'm not gonna take off points if you're a splitter. If you like to be a splitter, that's fine. But for the purposes of your exam, you should be happy that I'm a lumper. Why? Huh? Don't have to remember it, don't worry. No Homo Heidelberg is gonna be on your exam. No Homo habilis is gonna be on your exam because I'm an extreme lumper. You don't have to worry about that. Exams are about concepts and ideas, not about memorizing things at least in my class. So that doesn't mean it won't be hard. It just means you don't have to remember that. Um, I think the science has, has uh, you know, uh, part of this I will admit is personal preference. I feel like there have been too many splitters in human history. I feel like we're in an age of people who are trying to divide us and tell us how different we are. And so I prefer to be a lumper. But I also think the science has told us that over the past 20 years, which we'll talk about, is that a lot of these things that people were trying to demarcate and claiming to be separate species turn out to be not only not separate species, but very much involved in the genetic mixture of what makes us contemporary human beings. So, you know, yeah, I agree. I do agree that we should have we should have some something more on the creatures that were around the age of Homo heidelbergensis, but until they change that name around, I'm not listening to them. All right. Tass also mentioned the Neanderthals, which is um, which we have much more uh, skeletal and other information about. Um, again, in part because a lot of them were first found in. Europe, uh, the reason they get their name is because of the Neander Valley in which they were first found. And that you may notice that they are sometimes spelled T-H-A-L-S, which is the original spelling, but that comes to us from the old German uh, spelling or the old way in which the Thal was represented in English. Um, so it, it simply means valley, that T-H-A-L or T-A-L, the Neander Valley, but it's been spelled in two different ways. So in the updated, uh, updated spelling of this, we have Neanderthals, but you know, it's the same, the same stuff that was found in the Neander Valley. 
They were a very successful uh, species of homo that were originally found in Europe, but had a, a wider range. So it have been found in parts of the, what is now the Middle East as well, dating back to as far back as 400,000 years ago, probably emerged, but maybe we have better evidence of them around 130,000 years ago and coexisting with Homo sapiens up to around 35, 30,000 years ago, which is more than we used to think. They are usually more robust than Homo sapiens. So usually larger, maybe a little bit stronger, uh, have uh, sometimes very developed one, one arm or the other, which indicates that they were doing a lot of scraping of hides and stuff like that. Um, Alex, what do we know about their Yeah, they actually had cranial capacity that was larger than Homo sapiens. Now we have to be careful with this, as Alex is telling us. I'm not sure that it doesn't completely translate into, aha, they're smarter. Uh, a lot of this, you know, their, their brain organization and complexity may be different or are definitely different. And also, uh, when we're talking about cranial capacity, we also have to remember that that's as a percentage of body size, which since they're more robust, they might just have had larger larger heads in, in general. There is evidence for uh, that they carried out burials and people are finding things like jewelry. There's evidence that they cared for the members of their population that were sick or old and some of them that show evidence of, of deterioration in various ways were cared for into older than they, older than they would have lived. Uh, again, evidence for forms of hunting. Uh, so a pretty sophisticated and, and, um, and successful species that had, had quite a, a large geographical range as well. So we have the Neanderthals emerging uh, in the Middle East and in, uh, in Europe. And then uh, about 200 to 300,000 years ago, we have the emergence of Homo sapiens in Africa. So the oldest Homo sapiens, the oldest Homo sapien fossils have actually recently been discovered in Morocco, uh, which was not a place where people were expecting them to be at about 300,000 years ago. So we used to say about 200,000 years ago, but we've recently been pushing this date back a little bit uh, as in terms of the uh, Homo sapien uh, evolution. So Homo sapiens first emerge within Africa, and then there's an extremely successful spread of Homo sapiens. They are the first and the only bipedal creatures to migrate and get all the way into Australia. And then uh, as we'll talk about in the next section into the Americas. Um, and as the Homo sapiens go around, eventually they are first coexisting with some of the other bipedal species, but eventually the other bipedal species disappear. And so the Neanderthals go away and other species and other stuff that was going on that may have been descended from some of those Homo erectus populations or Homo heidelbergensis or whatever they were, they all go away. And so um, when the first Neanderthal skeletons were found in the Neander Valley, people were like, aha, we have the ancestor of Homo sapiens. But we quickly found out, relatively quickly, about 100 years ago, that the Neanderthals were not directly ancestral to Homo sapiens. It's not, there's, there's, there's no evidence that Neanderthals kind of evolved into Homo sapiens. 
But ever since the Neanderthals were found, there has been this question of, well, what was the interaction there? Did they interact? Are they the same species? Did they interbreed? And there were two main models proposed for how Homo sapiens arose and how they um, how how the, how they uh, how they interacted with the other Homo erectus species. One of the models that was at first favored in anthropology was called the multi-regional evolution or the regional continuity model. Don't worry, you don't have to copy all this down. This model actually comes to us from uh, Weidenreich, Franz Weidenreich. It was first proposed in 1946. So it is actually an old and complex and sophisticated model of human evolution. Some of the names here incorporating Gigantopithecus and some of these names here are not so, uh, are, are not the names that we want to use in today's world. But the model is interesting because what it posits is a continuous interflow of genes and genetic interflow across an entire geographical range that evolve as a single interbreeding species into the groups of humans that we have today. So there is always continuous gene flow across the range, but the reason they call it a regional continuity model is the idea that in all in these different parts of the world, um, their features are continuous with some of the Homo erectus features of those uh, populations. In 1987, and I still remember when my, uh, when my Dad showed me the copy of Newsweek with these highly stylized um, <laughs> people that were said to be Adam and Eve. Um, there was another model proposed, which uh, it was some of the first work that had been done with mitochondrial DNA, where uh, Rebecca Can and colleagues uh, took mitochondrial DNA from different, um, different populations, different contemporary populations, and figured out that by their estimation that all humans, all contemporary humans had a common African mother at about 75,000 years ago. And that these populations had replaced all of the Homo erectus, Neanderthal populations in other parts of the world. So this model went by several names, African Eve, out of Africa too, because it was a second migration from Africa or mitochondrial Eve or the replacement model, because what it posited was that there was no, no DNA continuity between the Homo uh, sapiens that emerged from Africa and the others that were the Homo erectus derived populations are already there. From 1987 to 2010, there was a, uh, the, the replacement model seemed to be winning the field. We were getting more and more genetic evidence that there was no, there was no mixture between Neanderthals or any other of the Homo erectus lineages that had gone into what is now China or Asia, um, it seemed like the, uh, the replacement model was the way to go. And in fact, although some of the, so there were some prominent people who were defending the regional continuity model, but it was, being one misrepresented, it was being said that they, you know, that the regional continuity model was saying that there were separate populations evolving into Homo sapiens. And in general, it was going away from the textbooks. And I stopped teaching it for a little bit. Uh, it was perhaps was the, well, the triumph of the splitters at that point, because uh, Homo sapiens seemed to have nothing to do with the Neanderthals. And I want to be clear that from the beginning, uh, and 
both of these models, the regional continuity model and the replacement model, always said that Homo sapiens from the beginning and throughout our history were always one interbreeding species. So there was never an idea in either of these models that there had been separate evolutions of Homo sapiens from uh, separate Homo erectus populations. Uh, both of them always said that this is that Homo sapiens evolved as and continue to be one interbreeding species. But for a long time, the replacement model seemed to have won it out. But then in 2010, we got what I call the one to 4% admixture surprise when people started doing even more sophisticated genetic analysis and taking more than mitochondrial DNA and what do we find, Alex, what happens with those Neanderthals? What do we find out about them? Yeah, we found out that there was, there's genetic evidence for Neanderthal interbreeding and admixture across Eurasia. So it looks like what happens is that there were, there were interbreeding populations or you know, some, some degree of intermixture as the Homo sapiens were in probably that Middle Eastern region. And uh, originally, of course, most people thought that the Neanderthal DNA would be among the European population because that's where we found a lot of the Neanderthals. But it turns out it's actually distributed across Asia and Europe. And some of the latest stuff I've been reading suggests that there might be more in contemporary Asian populations than in contemporary European populations. There was some, at the very beginning of this, there was a, a what it was actually, uh, the researcher John Hawks calls a myth that there was no uh, evidence of uh, inter or genetic admixture in African populations. That's actually not true. There's uh, there's less, perhaps, uh, Neanderthal DNA in African populations, but uh, there is some. And, um, you know, it's not very much in all of us, but there's, there's some. The other thing that happened around then is that uh, they were had a pinky bone and some other little stuff, and they found this uh, evidence of a new subspecies uh, that they call the Denisovans, who are kind of like cousins to the Neanderthals, except in the eastern part of the range uh, over in Siberia. They're named because found in Denisova Cave. There's not a lot of fossil or archaeological evidence from the Denisovans, but the genetic evidence is pretty good. And we can see that uh, in some contemporary populations, especially in the area of Australia and that, that in, in Asia, um, there is some, also some evidence for Denisovan DNA showing up. Not a lot, again, and when we talk about a little bit, maxing out at probably maybe 4%, which is not a lot, but some. So this has made things very confusing for everybody. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, huh, there's a lot of crazy stuff going around like Neanderthals gave us asthma or Neanderthals did this or Neanderthals make us depressed. Um, so just be careful with that. There's a, there's a lot of here to sort out and just because we have 1% Neanderthal DNA does not mean that they completely changed our lives. So, you know, we'll see what this all means. And whenever we see a headline, just be careful with it. What it seems to confirm is a model that John Rolliford over at SUNY Oneonta proposed long before any of the genetic stuff came out and was rather prescient, able to see things ahead of time. He talked about the mostly out of Africa model that most of the human genome and human evolution occurs within Africa, but not all, that there's been various migrations into and out of Africa and that those migrations are potentially genetically and uh, 
ancestrally important. So it's mostly out of bounds. For me, I want to emphasize that the I that humans have been moving around, mating and mixing together from a long, long, long time ago. And so a lot of times we're sitting around and people talk about, aha, people are coming together for the first time. And now people are seeing others from around the world. And well, no, that's been going on for millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years or however many you want. This is not just something that happened recently. It's not just something that happens occasionally. It happens all the time throughout human history. And there have never been any human populations that have gotten so isolated that they form anything like even what we might, we might call a subspecies. So in terms of Homo sapiens, the most isolated you might be able to say are people uh, who migrated into Australia from about maybe as early as 75,000 years ago. But as soon as, uh, as, soon as there was recontact, uh, there was plenty of moving, mating, and mixing, and there was no, there, there was, there's no, uh, there are no species separations within Homo sapiens. Now, that's uh, some of the stuff that's happened in terms of populations that we know now are related to contemporary Homo sapiens. There are a couple of other creatures populations that have been found that are very exciting, interesting. In fact, Delaney, you said they were the most fascinating for you. because discovered on the island of Flores in Indonesia. And yeah, Delaney is very good on the implications of this. Uh, Christine, also your favorites. Why? Yeah, no, they are, like I said, they're the most, they're the most liked. In fact, I was looking on them on Google. You know how you type in on Google and you find out and then what other people want to know about them? They want to know how tall they are. That's the first thing. And they're short. And then they want to know if they're still alive because it'd be cool to have them be still alive. And then they want to know if they're hobbits or not. Um, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, they're very fun little flores people. Um, <laughs> there was so much debate about like, are they a separate species? Are they simply humans with micro and or homo erectus with micro and uh, the, the small heads? Um, are they island dwarfism, which is the idea that they got to this island and everything shrinks down on islands or grows big because when you're on an island, weird things happen. It's really hard to tell. I think that the current consensus is a uh, separate species, um, not, not some sort of sick or, you know, not, not a kind of deformity. Um, but it's hard to say they're still off kind of in their own, their own thing. The other finding is that of Homo and the lady, which nobody wanted to write about, but uh, it has been pretty exciting to people in part because a lot of the finds that we talk about are like a jaw or a tooth. And here they have like 
all kinds of bones and all these uh, individuals and a really interesting story of how they had to spelunk into this cave uh, and it took some a very, uh, very daring, um, some, some very daring female spelunkers and anthropologists to get these things out. Um, but it's still unclear where exactly they fall in the lineage. Definitely seem to uh, coexist with some of the Homo sapiens in Africa, but not be there on their own thing. So what did these two finds give us? As Delaney was saying, I think what the biggest thing for me about Homo floresiensis and Homo naledi is that they help us to have a, what some have called the second cranial revolution. <laughs> So the first cranial revolution was that we found out that um, the big brains were not what separated the eventual ancestors of Homo sapiens from the other apes, but it was habitual bipedalism. So that we were we we were bipedal for a long time before we. Uh, before there was any cranium expansion, and that happened in the 1960s and 1970s. And the second revolution, which, uh, which Delaney described well, which I think is happening with the Homo floresiensis and Homo naledi, is uh, that you can have tool use and maybe even things like burying and hunting and all these things without necessarily having to have a big head to support it. And so Homo naledi and Homo floresiensis seem to be doing things with tools and thinking through things uh, that people just assume that you had to have more than, what, more than 400 cc's to do. And so, you know, I mean, there's still a lot of debate about where exactly, you know, what exactly they were doing and are we reading too much into the evidence but it seems to be that you can do a decent amount of stuff uh, more than we thought without necessarily having an expansion in uh, brain size so we'll see we'll we'll see how this goes in the coming years it also testifies i think to what uh what we called mosaic evolution and the ideas of punctuated equilibrium where you have these different combinations of traits that seem to be evolving at different rates in different populations, combining and recombining uh, together to give us what we are now. So this, so we have Homo erectus spreading out all over the place. This is my, my big graph for what happened. Then you have in Africa, you have all kinds of populations like Homo lady and probably more. You have Homo heidelbergensis and then the Neanderthals emerging in the Middle East and in Europe. You have then the Denisovans or actually probably around the same time emerging in what is now Asia. And then you have the Homo sapiens. Oh, Homo erectus goes away, right. <laughs> then you have these other populations. Then you have Homo sapiens emerging first in Africa and being in Africa. And then a pretty early migration out into all the way into Australia and probably some intercrossing here with the Nisovans and Neanderthals and then going into Eurasia. And basically then all the other populations have disappeared. And so you have Homo sapiens all throughout Eurasia, Australia, and Africa. And then from the, um, uh, some of the North Asian populations coming into the Americas, which we'll talk about uh, in the next unit. Um, but, you know, I don't want to overdo the Homo sapiens here, but yeah, Homo sapiens spread out to all the areas of the habitable world. Um, and there are no other bipedal creatures around except one 
population of interbreeding Homo sapiens by about 30,000 years ago. So that's where we kind of end up. So, how are we doing? Before we go into Wednesday's class, I want to summarize the evolution, the, the big points. First, always remember that when it comes to the mechanism of evolution, natural selection, that you need diversity or variation. You need to have that. If you don't have it, you don't have evolution. So it's essential that we have diversity and variation in. It's the basis, the ground for the evolutionary process. That was the, the big find of Darwin and Wallace. We know now that evolution is not about survival of the fittest, but that there are trade-offs in evolution and that fitness can only be measured, the traits that are good or bad in ever-changing environments. We also know, if we use the extended evolutionary synthesis, that as organisms are being alive and doing things, and we see this more and more with the evolution of our own kind of Homo erectus with all those tools and Neanderthals, they're changing their environments. And so they change the conditions for selection for the next generation and are both adapting to and adapting and, and, uh, and contributing to the construction, the actual building of different niches. We also know that in evolution, there's a lot of stuff that you can't predict and is just random and is gonna have huge change. So let's, rewind back to a few episodes in evolution. Let's say you could go back to the age of the dinosaurs. And there's these huge creatures that have evolved going around and doing all those cool dinosaur things, Jurassic Park style. And there's these little tiny mammals running around and there are little tiny mammals that are hiding out and getting stomped on every so often. No one would say that the mammals were gonna make it be the big thing next. A little asteroid or something happened and then random. Or if you went back to say the time of the, the great apes and looked at Gigantopithecus, that sculpture that we have out at Hartwick and said, aha, Gigantopithecus, that's gonna be the big one. I know it. Well, Gigantopithecus has gone away. No more Gigantopithecus. Or if you went back to the Neanderthals and you talked about their big heads and their neurons and their robust bodies and how they're going to really adapt and change everything. Yeah, I would have put my money definitely on the Neanderthals, not on those puny homo sapiens that were coming out. Neanderthals look much cooler. So you can't rewind. I mean, or, I mean, you can rewind and you can make predictions. But the thing is, a lot of random stuff happens. You don't know which traits are going to be good and which traits are going to be bad. The other thing we know is that although it's debatable how many species there were, or if it's like variation within a species, we know that up until about 30,000 years ago, are the ancestors, our own ancestors, the Homo sapiens, there was a pretty wide range of bipedals that they were interacting with. Creatures with, you know, that probably had forms of language and could use tools. And so there was a quite a range. The range now, I guess I would say the range now is less. So as Homo sapiens emerge as one single interbreeding species, we, Homo sapiens, are actually a subset of this earlier variation. Some have called us a relict species in the sense that we are all that remains of a much wider range of variation that was 
true back in the day. And so the reason that Homo sapiens are able to go all these different places is because of a sophisticated toolkit and that was flexible and the kind of learning that we that Homo sapiens were able to do in different environments. Now, what I hope this all adds up to. So a lot of people have tried to use evolution to support their ideas about racial traits and superiority and inferiority. But in fact, what evolution tells us is that given this situation, we should be pretty suspicious of those who want to draw lines within the homo sapien population of today and say, aha, here's a race. And this race has these characteristics. and They are more superior or more inferior to this other group that we're going to call a race. The evolution Evolutionary theory very much would, would, uh, would, would cause us to be suspicious of or very careful of making these kinds of assumptions around groups. But that's what we'll go into in much greater depth in the next class. When